everyone, I'm Marley Hall. Welcome to the show that covers the culture like no other. Joining us today, a panel of experts to give us their unfiltered opinions. We have public relations expert, Sarita J. Oglesby, journalist, Lionel Moise, and D Nasty, comedian and vice news correspondent. Thank you so much for joining us. A number of trending topics to cover today, so let's get right into it. Comedian and actress Monique is never afraid to bring the smoke. This time, her target is Netflix. The Oscar winner confirmed that she has filed a pay discrimination lawsuit against the streaming company for gender and race bias. If you recall, last year she asked fans to boycott Netflix after they offered her $500,000 for a comedy special, a figure she felt was unfair considering they gave Amy Schumer $13 million, Chris Rock got $40 million, and Dave Chappelle received $20 million for each of his three specials. So here's how the conversation went between Netflix and Monique. Listen. When we asked Netflix to explain the difference, why the money was so different, they said, well, we believe that's what Monique will bring. We said, well, what about my resume? They said, we don't go off of resumes. Then we asked them, what was it about Amy Schumer? And they said, well, she sold out Madison Square Garden twice, and she had a big movie over the summer. Is that not Amy Schumer's resume? So Netflix said they believe their opening offer was fair, and that is why they will be fighting the lawsuit. So Monique has an Oscar, an Emmy nomination, and a Grammy for a comedy special. So Dean Nasty, you're the professional comedian. Do you believe that Monique is worth more than half a million dollars? 100%. Um, when I hear about the story about Monique, I'm very upset about it. I get really mad about it because I feel like how she said about the whole situation with the resume, right? Like, or even the credibility. I feel like as soon as she opened her mouth, everyone attacked her and jumped on her and decided to say, you know, she hasn't done anything in a while. She's not relevant. But you know what? Um, Eddie Murphy is getting offered 70, or got offered $70 million. And he's been out of the comedy scene for a very long time. A lot more than uh, Monica. So it's kind of... I just feel like as a woman, any little thing that you say to defend yourself, anyone is going to go ahead and try to uh, say that you have an attitude. And, you know, so many people attacked her. You know, she got donkey of the day on 105.1. Mm -hmm. She, Steve Harvey had all these opinions. And it's just like, this is a woman, this is a black woman with an opinion. She's saying it and now she has an attitude. Now they're saying that she's wild. And now they're saying that she's crazy for even mentioning it because she's not relevant anymore. So I just feel like we need to put a little bit of respect on Monique's name. You know, she is one of the original queens of comedy. She was a leading lady in her own sitcom in the 90s for almost six years. You know, especially in a, in a time when they're... She wasn't the ideal traditional standards of beauty or whatever you want to say. So she has held her own. Her resume is lengthy. She has held down. She has held her own. Mm -hmm. You know, she stands the test of time when it comes to longevity. So I do feel like it's one of those things where it's, they're attacking her for having an opinion and for standing up for herself. And I just feel that I feel bad that so many people decided to discredit her in the way that they did because it almost felt like a disclaimer, you know, like, mm. oh, she's wilding out, but I'm not like her, you know? So I right. really didn't respect that. And I stand with Monique. I feel like she, I, I'm, I stand with her. Right, because a lot of people didn't stand with her. No, they didn't. Mm -hmm. Well, do you believe that Netflix offer was fair? I don't. Uh, I don't feel like it was fair for a number of reasons. I echo the same sentiments um, as D in this situation. I do feel like, because I think there was a case right after that where Tracy Ellis Ross complained about her mm -hmm. her pay disparity shortly thereafter. And there, to her point, there was a lot, a lot of sympathy that was given to her in her mm -hmm. circumstance. And I do feel like, you know, Monique, um, I think there was some other factors that may have been playing behind the scenes and why she had such a visceral response to her initial boycott request. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there was other politics that were involved in her circumstance that may have lend, you know, for negative publicity. What are those um, politics? I think that, you know, there have been rumored that she had been blacklisted, mm -hmm. right? And so there is an optic that's given out, unfortunately, when you are in a position where your, you know, a credibility could be maligned. And so, therefore, there could be some substantiated things that have played a factor in why she has not had similar roles to what she had in Precious or, you know, um, award-winning films that she has been a part of. She has an Oscar. But yeah. I still, I, she has an Oscar. Yeah. As much as I do feel, you know, I come from a family of black women and I feel that women and black women should be paired, paid fairly, I do think it's a fine line of your self-worth. And so I could demand that every network I go work for pays me $15 million because Anderson Cooper makes it and maybe... And I don't know if that's what he actually makes. Let's make that disclaimer now. But maybe the network may not see me as that guy to them who is worth the $15 million And I could believe it or have accomplished all of these things. And it's still not my place to make that argument. They have 
the choice to hire who they want and pay who they want. Although I do think they use fear in making us feel that we cannot speak about our pay mm -hmm. to demand the equality when it is unfair. And so mm -hmm. when you're sitting next to your counterpart, mm -hmm. especially, you know, in a news program or you're working at an office, we're never really saying like, hey, they're paying me this every week because you're afraid that it's going to affect something. And so I do think that her taking a stand is something that we need, but I do think we should take it with caution. You can't just immediately believe that she's being mistreated. I feel like she is being black blacklisted. I disagree. I feel like she pissed somebody off, and I think that in this industry, it's um, it's really sad that a lot of it has to do with ass kissing mm -hmm. and not about raw talent. And everybody knows that Monique is very talented, and Super. she deserves respect. Half a half a mil when people are getting seventy million dollars—that's right. insane to me. Mm -hmm. And I she's mean, not down with the ass kissing. Hell no. Yes. <laughs> I think it was Jack K. Harry. I, I'm, I'm gonna butcher the statement completely, but she said something about. Um, the the value of your integrity versus like the the cost of being fake, you know, and it's just it's true, you know. The yeah. more that I get into this industry, the more that I see that, and it's really it's a little it, it hurts a little bit. Mm. Yeah, not to mention, I think even as in regular everyday life, to your point, I think there was an article that was placed on Forbes.com talking about you do need to have conversation about what you deserve in terms of fair pay, Absolutely. right? Because you are sitting next and right and left to people, and you could be really bringing a lot to an organization in terms of value, and then you know not getting which you really deserve yeah. payment-wise. Black women get thing. 74 cents on the dollar as yeah. opposed to a white man, 53 cents for a Latina woman right. as opposed which to a white ridiculous. man. Right. For the same job. And we be yeah. working hard and we look cute. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Well, I do think Monique is worth more than Netflix says she is, but I also think that when you get an offer, you should just take it or leave it or go where they recognize your worth. Absolutely. So singer Alicia Keys is fighting as well, but her issue is with labels surrounding gender expression. On Instagram, the singer shared that she went to the salon with her young son, Genesis, who asked for rainbow-colored nails. He then backtracked because he thought he might be teased. Listen to this. Can you believe this? Four years old. He's four. And he already understands the concept that someone's going to judge him because he chose rainbow colored on his nails. And I told him, why? Nobody's going to judge it. They're going to love it. It's so cool. Like, look how creative you are. Look how amazing you had this idea. Stick with it. You chose it. You liked it. You do it. Who cares what anybody else says? And model Cynthia Bailey had a similar exchange with her 20-year-old daughter, Noelle, who came out as fluid during an episode of The Real Housewives of Atlanta. Take a look. So you like guys and girls? People like to try to box everybody in and put labels on everything, but I don't really do that. Like, OK. So you just like what you like? Yeah, and that's just what it is. So, Lionel, I'm coming to you first. Do you believe that this is a brave or progressive stance for a parent, especially a black parent? Yes, uh, and I commend both Cynthia Bailey and Alicia Keys for the way that they're handling their children. Coming out is something that is very difficult, especially for a child who is still learning who they are. I'm an adult. I still don't even know what I want to eat for dinner every night. <laughs> You're finding yourself. And when you have a society that is expecting you to conform a certain way, and parents are reinforcing it just by not knowing any better, a child does not know how to be themselves. And I just remember distinctly being in Walmart when I was younger and having a conversation with my mom, who is the most supporting and loving person. She was uh, my, my best friend and right hand when I came out, but even her about the optics of me having a shampoo bottle that was pink. Who cares? I'm washing my hair. Right. You know, it's nails. It doesn't change the person you are. Uh, and straight kids and adults do not have to go through all of this work to declare who they are and that that's good enough. You know, uh, if a rock star paints his nails black, it's like, oh, he's hip. But because this little boy wants to have rainbow colors, which kids are learning colors and oh, yeah. the world at that time, we're immediately going to look at this kid as something is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I, I just respect Alicia Keys for telling him to stick to his decision and reinforcing that. And for Cynthia Bailey, for how she handled her daughter, she asked questions and basically said, I want you to be with someone who's going to love you and treat you right, which yeah. is essentially what we all need and what, what mm -hmm. every parent should be teaching their child. And so for these celebrities to use their platform and to speak out about it, I hope it can open other people's minds who may be naive to some of the, the issues that you deal with just trying to be the person that you were born to be. Mm -hmm. And Noelle said that she did not want to be put in any boxes and avoiding those labels. Do you think that's something we should do generally, stop labeling people as a certain thing? 
Absolutely. I think that it's 2019 and a lot of people are becoming a lot more understanding with people and their preferences. And I, I stand with uh, both Cynthia as well as Alicia for standing up for their kids and trying to understand. Um, what I would say about Noelle, she's a 21 year, she's a 20 old year, year old woman, excuse mm -hmm. me. Um, and she has every right to say and like and whatever it is that she wants. Now, as for Alicia Key's son, um, I think when it comes to the colors of the rainbows, it's before it's a, a symbol for anything, it, it, it's something that you learn in kindergarten. Your one, two, threes, your ABCs, and your colors. Um, so if you want to wear something that's rainbow, I don't think there's a problem with it. However, I do feel that children should just be kids, male or female. Um, I don't, if I had a four-year-old daughter or a four-year-old son, I wouldn't be painting their nails, but that's my own personal opinion. Mm -hmm. I feel like um, how Freddie Wobb's baby mama said, let kids be kids. And I do, I guess I'm a little old school in that sense. Like, I don't want to see kids with makeup. I don't want to see kids painting their nails. I don't want to see kids in little heels. Mm. So that's the only thing that I would say. But if you wanted to wear a rainbow colored shirt or whatever it is, that's an innocence that comes from a child. I like these colors. I want to wear them. Um, I don't even think if the kid was saying that, you know, making a statement, I just like these colors. Mm -hmm. But if it were to be a statement, the fact that she is so supportive of her son, I agree with that wholeheartedly. But I don't, I'm not here for kids painting their nails. <laughs> there you go. Kids should be kids. Kids should be kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I do want to say that also these kids are growing up in a public eye. We've seen Noelle since she was a little girl, I mm -hmm. believe, like since the age of 10 or 12 yeah. on the show. And so to see the type of woman that she has evolved into, which she is very definitive about what it is that she wants. She's a student at Howard University, Thanks. you know, so she's really, really, you know, coming to her own as a woman. So I definitely applaud her also because that's a very scary thing to come out to millions and millions of people not knowing how they're going to be receiving you too. And you did not ask for the spotlight. Both mm -hmm. of your parents just happened to be in it. She have a choice. Yes, right. but, but it did work because <laughs> yeah. her mom did say her DMs yes. were popping after. Yes. So. Yes. The community, right. they embraced her, which right. is a, another example, of a reinforcement of what we're trying to make here. Absolutely. I mean, just, we're taught to be ashamed of ourselves. We can equally be taught to love ourselves and yes. the person we are. And I think that's what Cynthia was reinforcing to her daughter Absolutely. there. But yeah. right, look, she got those follows. She is going to find someone <laughs> to love her the way that she deserves. Right. That's Absolutely. for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And so should everyone else. So let me ask you about Alicia Key's son. Do you believe that it was Alicia's story to tell? Or is that something that her son should have been able to express on his, his own when he's ready? I think that that is perfectly fine for Alicia Keys to say, because I think that we try to sexualize sexuality so young. Like, just because a kid is saying that they want their nails painted, I could have worn my mom's heels or put on her skirt. That did not necessarily mean that I was going to grow up and be gay or was going to be something that was wrong. Sure, so it, when you when you make it something that's such a secret and you should be so ashamed of, then he's going to think like, oh, the color nail I pick is is a bad choice. You know, the way that she handled like whatever. If you like it, do it. If you if you like it today, it's fine. Mm -hmm he's gonna to learn to not think about something like that. And I think that's what society needs to do more of. And frankly, minding their business. Like who cares <laughs> what color someone else's kid's nails are? Who cares? Like mm -hmm. what does it affect you at night or your family or your livelihood? It really affects nothing. And But it can really mean so much to that child if you shun them for expressing their creativity. But when they grow up to be Van Gogh and yeah. using all these colors of the rainbow and you look back and say, oh, they were so creative. You know, if someone was walking yeah. around dressed like Prince every day, we'd 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 look at them sideways. But when Prince has shown his talent and the mm -hmm. world has embraced it, we're like, oh, we love the way that he dressed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You you have to hold the, hold the same standard all the time. Yeah. Yes. And do you believe that there is a lesson in here for other parents? Yes, I think that the lesson is to just let the kids be free to decide what they want to be. I think that, you know, we are, you know, to his point, you sometimes are put into a box even by your own family members, you know, and so this is an opportunity for that open dialogue to happen, you know, so that it doesn't, you know, we see most the suicide rates increasing, especially in young teenagers between the ages of 13 and 19 mm -hmm. years old, and a lot of them happen to be of LGBT, you know, um, sexual orientation, right? And so a lot of those things that are you're taught or, you know, are not necessarily aligned with that, you know? So I think that parenting is important for embracing yourself and loving on yourself from that perspective. Mm. Well, I think it's so brave that Noelle came out to the world the way she did, mm -hmm. and I'm glad she got the chance to tell her truth the way she wanted. So coming up, a popular actor is attacking the black media and a football brawl got way out of hand. Maybe we should call today Fight 'em Friday. All that and more <laughs> when we come back. <laughs>
Welcome back. So the Cleveland Browns won last night, but they also lost their best player for the rest of the season. Take a look at this video. A nasty fight erupted in the final moments of the game against the Pittsburgh Steelers. It looks like quarterback Mason Rudolph attempts to remove Miles Garrett's headgear while they're on the ground. Garrett then rips off Rudolph's helmet and hits him with it. That's when Steelers players charge at Garrett, throwing punches. One player even kicks him in the head. Here's what Miles Garrett and Mason Rudolph had to say about the incident. Listen. You know, that, that is embarrassing. You know, what I did was more foolish and I shouldn't have allowed myself to, to slip like that. That's, out of character. But I know it's Bush League, I know he's, you know, total coward move on his part. You know, I, I get it. I mean, it's, it's okay, though. You know, I'll take it. I'm, I'm not going to back down from any bully out there. So we'll, we'll see what happens. So the melee sparked spicy reactions on social media. Hall of Famer Deion Sanders gave his two cents. He tweeted this. Mason Rudolph should be significantly fined as well for trying to rip Miles Garrett helmet off his high off his head, which ignited the retaliation. He's not without fault in the unfortunate matter. This is a physical, emotional game played by men. Let's not forget that. So the NFL handed down its decision. Miles Garrett is suspended for the rest of the season. So, Sarita, what do you think of the NFL's decision? I, I think it is completely unfair. Um, you Why? know, I think because so the uh, art, it's an article which talks about when um, the player's uh, helmet is removed is used as a weapon, right? And so the sanction really should be two to four games. You should not be suspended for the whole season. This is a contact sport. This is white privilege playing out, yep. and period. Mm, so you feel like the outcome would have been different if, let's say, the roles were reversed, yes, that if Rudolph, it, Rudolph hit Miles Garrett? Absolutely. Rudolph was charging at him. So, of course, Garrett is in a position where he has to defend himself. And unfortunately, sometimes you write a, a check that your ass can't cash mm. and you got beat up. Right. And so, yeah, his teammates are going to jump in and help. Right. Because that's what people do. It is an emotional high charge. They have all this adrenaline and it's a contact sport. Everybody knows that football is a very heavy contact sport. So things like this, this happen. It happens in hockey. People get hit in the, the teeth with, with pucks mm -hmm. and in uh, the, the, the hockey pucks and all the, the, uh, the sticks. Mm -hmm. And then you have baseball where people are charging at you with 100 mile per hour balls. You don't see these kind of suspensions take place in those other sports. I think it's definitely speaking, you know, and unfortunately the NFL is in a position which, you know, talks about race a lot. There's been a lot of controversy here. So I do feel like this is a bit extreme. Um, I think it's a bit unfair and, you know, it really is just unjustified. Are you saying that you believe Rudolph deserved that strike with the helmet? I don't think he deserved it. You know, I don't think anybody deserves to get hit with something, but you charged at someone and you attempted to take off their helmet. So if they're in a position to defend themselves, mm -hmm. if somebody pushes you up against the wall, you're going to respond. That's called fight or flight. It's self-defense. It's self-defense. Mm. And so if you attempted to try to take my helmet off to hit me with it, I don't know what you're about to do to me. So your natural reflexes, although it wasn't the best decision, you know, from him, for his perspective, it, it wasn't a good decision. But at the end of the day, like, you attempted to try to do something to me first. I just happened to be very defensive and making sure I took care of my safety. Mm. So, Dee, do you believe that Rudolph should be penalized as well? Absolutely. I feel like both of them should be penalized, yeah. but my, what I'm seeing is a case of self-defense. And I also do see, I'm sorry, I don't know their names. This is the first time I've seen the story. <laughs> Rudolph but, um, Which one is the white one? Rudolph. 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 Okay. <laughs> Rudolph. <laughs> I don't know sports, you guys. I don't know sports. We're, but, just, we're filling you in. Right. We're filling you in. <laughs> He, they jumped him, you know. He's yeah. the one who started. Yes, he, he defended did. himself, yeah. and then his team players jumped him. He they did. kicked him in the head. Yeah. So, um, I do see that tensions were high and things happen, and it, like you know, your endorphins are running and your adrenaline yeah. is kicking in. But everyone should be penalized. Everyone. Absolutely. I feel like yeah. it's not only the two players. I think the people who decided to jump in Absolutely. should be penalized as well. Mm -hmm. The fact that he's not, I, I don't know. I think it's it's very odd. It shows to the favoritism, especially we've seen this happening with the NFL for a while. Yeah. We've had the Colin Kaepernick conversation already. You know mm -hmm. what's going on. So I I don't know. I feel like he was trying to defend himself and he got the short end of the stick in this situation. And just be fair, like. If we know that this is a contact sport that can be uh, the difference between someone being paralyzed and being able to walk if they're mm -hmm. injured. So if the helmet is so important. Exactly. Anyone involved in this fight should be immediately suspended the same and we should not be having this conversation. Absolutely. We should not be picking and choosing who's more right or wrong. Yeah. And especially the person who started this altercation, mm -hmm. whether or not they were successful in taking off the helmet, he should be suspended just yeah. like 
uh, no. just like Garrett was. He and failed I think to take it off, but he right. tried first. You started a fight. Your attention. Your attention. You put everyone at yeah. risk. You broke the rules. You should be penalized the same. And I think mm -hmm. that is why people are going to then look and question, is it racially motivated, mm -hmm. this decision that's being handed down because you're seeing two players who are involved in the same scuffle, but the 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 peanut penalty, excuse me, I'm getting fired up. <laughs> the penalty that they're getting is not the same. And, and then you see him playing the victim card too, like, oh, oh I'm not gonna bully. have a bully. You jumped my man. The right. world you know saw you saying? do that. Right, and then you play real arrogant as well. Like, that was the way that the clip played is that, like, you had no remorse for the attempt that you also, like, you played a, a, a pick because you could definitely see Garrett was definitely sorry. Remorseful. He was exactly. very yes. remorseful in his behavior and it's like, okay, I didn't make a good decision. I took accountability. Absolutely. You know, whereas him, he's just like, Rudolph yeah. is just smug. He's just like, yeah, just, you know, like, and so yeah, it definitely reads off like, oh, I got it like that. I have yep. it like that. Like, I don't have to have consequence the same way that this man is going to feel it for the rest of the season, knowing that he could potentially get cut because we know that again, NFL also will cut you. It doesn't matter. Like, you could be a star player and get cut on the same day. Exactly. But don't you feel Garrett's reaction was extreme? No, because I feel like it would if it would if the roles were reversed and and Rudolph definitely was successful with taking off his helmet and hitting him in the but head. But he wasn't. Well, what if he had been? He had made the attempt. Again, we have to look at attempt and attention. Why were you attempted to take his helmet off in the first place? And again, this man saw you do it, so he's not. He's his senses, his sensories are off. Right, so you're in the heat of the moment. Yeah, you're, you're in the middle of a play. You know, I'm not. I don't watch football that often, but I know how intense the sport could be because you know, just because of the fact that it's competitive. So it's like, well, I don't know what you're about to do to me. So I'm gonna do it to you first. Like you said, mm. don't yeah. write checks you can't cash. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, don't both start of their something. checks need to bounce. <laughs> There he is. Here he is. <laughs> Drop Mike. Well, this isn't the first time Miles Garrett is being penalized for violent behavior. He was fined over $52,000 this season alone for his dirty hits. So hopefully he learns his lesson this time. Mm. So from fighting on the field to a war of words, actor Lakeith Stanfield is beloved for his role as oddball Darius on the hit show Atlanta, but he took a stand today that some see as disrespectful. In a lengthy Instagram post, Danfield specifically calls out The Shade Room, Lipstick Alley, The Breakfast Club, and World Star, black media outlets that he accuses of being anti-black. Here's a bit of it. It says, it's a fact that a lot of these platforms are usually or tend to be feeding grounds for negative reinforcement toward black nonconformists. And Lakeith didn't stop there. He also wrote this. He said, quote, they serve as bottomless coward consumption pits and digital audio and otherwise slave mentality mm -hmm. museums. So Breakfast Club host Charlemagne the God fired back. Here's what he had to say. See, as a black person, it's safe to go at black outlets like Shade Room, World Star, Lipstick Alley, Breakfast Club, and many others, as you said. But you would never fix your mouth to say that about any of the white outlets that do the same damn thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you know that would affect you in Hollywood. So who's the real coward? So let's go back to the slave mentality museums thing. So Lionel, you're a journalist. I'm struggling to understand what he means by that. Do you get it? I, I do not, so I do not want to speak for him. I, I do understand certain concerns with maybe the messaging that can be portrayed from certain media outlets. A lot of times maybe we're liking these posts and it's all gossip or the negative things that are happening maybe within the community, but I don't necessarily know what he meant by the slave mentality, and I do agree with Charlemagne that you have to hold everyone accountable. Oh, yeah. It is Mm -hmm. uh, racist from the bottom to the top. It is something that our country has been working on. We need more representation in media from every color, every skin tone, and we know that that is not the case. And so for you to go after these outlets, which maybe you could consider the quality of their news, maybe not to your liking, but they are still covering black culture and black events, mm -hmm. you need to go after the, the other ones as well. And I think Charlemagne brought up a good point. Yes. Right. The slave mentality part I didn't get. I do sometimes feel that there's a lot of gossip that we are continuing to, you know, highlight. And I don't think that maybe everyone needs to know who everyone's new boyfriend and girlfriend is every day, yeah. but they're still, they're still creating a space to cover our culture. And I don't think that you can completely come after them without going after everyone yeah, else. Yeah, I feel like when it comes to, to those outlets as well, like, like Lipstick Alley or Shade Room, 
what we see here is like, this is not new. We've been seeing it with ET. We've been seeing it with EV. So there's gossip columns across the board. So right. it's just, mainstream media as well. Mainstream media. We love it. Look at what they did to Britney Spears and Mariah Carey when they were having mental breakdowns on television. They were out here, mm -hmm. out here and people were talking about it left mm -hmm. and right. So to just call them out is a little weird. I have mixed emotions about it because I do sometimes feel that because as minorities, we do get the short end of the stick. Yeah. We should be not highlighting the negative things about one another. However, it's, it, how can I say this? It's just like, you gotta do what you gotta do when it comes to gossip media. That is something that's in demand right now. People like to hear that. We like to hear it in the in the Latin media, in the white media, mm -hmm. in the black media. I don't think it's a one race thing. Um, it's just one of those things that I feel mixed emotions about because I do, you know, you wanna stand with your brothers and sisters, but if there's some hot tea, you wanna talk about it too, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and from a PR perspective, it definitely lends to, you know, why uh, sometimes black talent does not talk to black media. You know, um, we have, you, we have diversity amongst our, you know, organi organizations as well. So just as much as you have the shade room, you have Essence. You know, they, you know, you have Sheen magazine and a number of other notable publications that cover it from a different space. Do you even give them the opportunity to have an interview with you? Yeah. But see, you I know, think that I brings think up a, a big point that also needs to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. And him coming for these publications, it is an ongoing issue when you're on the red carpet and you're trying yeah. to get an interview. Yes. And I don't know if you remember the situation where Halle Berry went back and stopped against what her publicist was telling her to do and spoke to the journalists from the black media publications, we cannot expect them to have all of these great interviews and this content that we won, but then when we're getting the shine and we're getting all of our accolades, we're gonna turn our back to the oh, black journalists know. who are here yeah. trying to promote your positive story. They can easily get the tea and the gossip without any uh, words from your mouth to cover on the shade room every day. Mm -hmm. But are you gonna stop and talk to them about that new project or, or give them that little bit of information so they can elevate you or elevate their platform? And mm -hmm. I think that's something that also needs to be yeah. called out because there are so many times where I've been on the red carpet mm -hmm with a white publication or a, a predominantly black publication, and people will walk past you because they don't think that you're important enough yeah. until they need yes. you one day. Exactly. Yes, mm -hmm. and then like you also have to deal with the fact that, again, I can only report what you give me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, so yes. There's, there's a content conversation, right? So if you, to his point, if you're on the carpet and I'm able to get really good sound bites from you, you know, that can I can build a bigger, more positive story about, because The Shave Room actually does feature positive stories. It's not just very gossipy. You might see it on the Instagram post, but if you actually look on the website, they cover a lot of community events. They cover a lot yes, of different things, you know. So, yes, there has been this um, this demonizing almost of a sense of, you know, these websites because you only see, you only tend to see the negative things. But if you dig deep and you read, you'll see that there's other things that they cover in terms of diversity on their sites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just to add on that, you have to yeah. take the good and the bad with media. Yes. Exactly. And it's one of those things that it, it, it almost echoes like the sense of, you know, um, we ha like it's unfair to have to be the representation for your whole race. Absolutely. You don't go to white people and tell them, okay, you did something bad and now E is talking about you. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So it's kind of messed up to have to say that to black people, like or, or or Spanish people or any other ethnicity. Like you cannot be one person is not here to be the whole representation for a whole race. Right. So mm -hmm. that's why I feel like I, I feel him. You don't want to see your brothers and sisters in a negative light, but people are individuals and they have their stories. And if it's good and if it's bad, the media is gonna pick it up. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But Sarita, you know this is a PR professional. Yeah. that sometimes publicists want to be very efficient. So they want to take their clients to the outlets that have the most distribution and will reach the most people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's not black media. I don't agree. I don't agree. I think that black media keeps you relevant mm -hmm. when white media stops talking about you. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So you might have a really great placement in Harper's Bazaar or Vogue magazine. That's one story. But I know Essence is going to continue to post everything I send them about you. Right, and they generate 3.1 million impressions and are the number one in African-American outlets. You have Interactive One, who is with Hello Beautiful, Madame Noir, huge footprints in our community, Global Grind. You know, I can go on and on and on. You know, Shade Room generates millions of impressions. People pay thousands of dollars to advertise on these places. You know, so the same way that uh, the talk should be looked at is the same way, the same respect I give to Sister Circle Live, who has 51, 59 million impressions daily in African-American-based markets. 
And when you have to go and promote a movie or a TV show or a record, guess who's buying your pro your project more often than not? Because we are the ones with the buying power. Mm -hmm. People forget that we have a twenty. We are trending a twenty. Uh, was it two trillion or twenty trillion um, dollar amount by twenty twenty? You know, so we are the we are the culture creators. We are the ones that make things cool. So just because you are embraced by GQ or you are embraced by these more mainstream publications does not mean you turn your back simply because of that. And publicists need to educate themselves consistently on what their impressions are. I think that that's a, um, that is an excuse, is a really poor excuse to not be educating. You should constantly elevate all the time as part of your profession, no matter if you're the journalist or you're the publicist. And the audience. Look at yeah. Black Twitter. Yeah. Right. Just like everything you. that trends. Exactly. <laughs> black Twitter is a you. thing. The fact that there's a black Twitter is a thing. You know what I'm saying? Right. Look at the Popeye's chicken sandwich. Right. 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 That right. was all Twitter. Negative and, and, and positive, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And so just like with that situation, like people are like, oh, you know, we should be spending our time. It's a sandwich. Like, let me just live my life, you yeah. know? Unfortunately, yes. It's, it, you know, negative things happen all the time, but it's food. Like, you know, like you're making a big deal about this and like, oh, you need to be focused more on your cultural thing. Well, I could be woke and still eat. Exactly. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> you need to eat so you right. can have the energy exactly. to be woke. Yes. <laughs> well, there should definitely be some dialogue to heal the rift that seems to be developing because if black newsmakers shun black media and vice versa, that puts us in a very sad predicament. Mm -hmm. So up next, a popular 1990s cop has been called back to duty. More to come on the comedy classic Netflix is bringing back to life. Stay tuned. Yes. Hey, welcome back. Actor Eddie Murphy is having a big year and it's about to get even bigger. The comedian will return as Axel Foley for the fourth installment of Beverly Hills Cop. Remember this from the original film? Take a look. Sir, do it right now, please. What kind of shit is this, man? Hold up. Wait a second. <laughs> well, there's no word yet on when the film will come out, but it will be released on Netflix. So Beverly Hills Cop 3 has a 3 out of 5 star rating on IMDb. So let's be honest with ourselves. How interested do you think people are in seeing a number 4? I think that they are interested. I think that it also just plays into the fact, again, that they're seeing Eddie Murphy have a resurgence, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's going to be an interest there, you know, in general. So I think that the film is, is going to be exciting no matter what the rating really is. I think that they're going to have some people who are going to be just supportive. Mm -hmm. And Dolomite just recently yeah. came out. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. amazing. Yeah. So based on that, do you have very high expectations for Beverly Hills Cop 4? Absolutely. <laughs> Eddie Murphy is a legend, and he's definitely making a resurgence. It's a renaissance, as you yeah. said earlier. Like, he's killing the game. He's gonna have his special. He's coming back to yeah. uh, uh, stand up comedy and just to do the Dolomite, which I saw and I saw oh. so inspirational. I was like, this is an inspiration. Like, mm -hmm. I can do it by myself. Yes. So, and my own, you know, so like, I just loved it and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's gonna mm -hmm. be awesome. Lionel, you're as looking forward? Soon, as soon as you mentioned Beverly Hills Cop, all I could think of was Dolomite. I think that he <laughs> is reinventing himself mm -hmm. for a new generation. He is such a great comedian, but his acting is just stellar and so yeah. we're getting both both sides of eddie murphy mm -hmm. i'm glad that netflix is supporting him and giving him these deals but i think after dolomite he's gonna have no problem promoting any movie i was completely blown away inspired laughing and crying uh -huh. watching that Hell movie yeah. i've seen it already three <laughs> times mm -hmm. Just yeah. really good. It is his time, and I'm just so happy that he's coming back. Yes, and I also think too, like with the coming uh, coming to America, you mm -hmm. know, um, I think that that also he has reopened those conversations for Arsenio Hall and Wesley mm -hmm. Snipes. He's given them new jobs, and other people who were a part of that initial, you know, that is one of my favorite movies of all time. You know, mm -hmm. and I think that that is going to help increase what coming to America was to our generation mm -hmm. to others. It's going to create additional exposure and more job opportunities. People mm. love nostalgia. Did you see yeah. the clip of Will Smith? I think it was yes. Martin. Yes. And oh. Oh. Yes. 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 <laughs> so, Dee, what's your favorite Eddie Murphy movie? Coming to America, definitely. I've seen it like eight times already. 
So right. More and more. Yeah. I might have seen it 18 times. Are people been making fun of your hair the little soul glow? Soul glow. Hello, I know what about you? Boomerang. I was, oh, I was yeah, too young to be watching that movie when I was younger, but it is just a classic. I just love it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> My mother is watching this. Look, Mom, I was sneaking when I was younger, but I love that movie. I don't have any passes on. <laughs> <laughs> so no favorite movie for you? Oh, coming to America all day. Mm-hmm. Those lines, like, that movie got funnier and funnier and <laughs> funnier. Like, this is a thing, how outrageous and, like, outlandish some of the things were in that movie. I mean, it's incredible. Incredible. I'm so happy. I think I say, my son, what? <laughs> 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 you know, from America, Jack, that's my yeah. favorite line. Like, I'm gonna kick your royal, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so many good lines. Oh, well, we'll be seeing more of Eddie Murphy soon. It's reported that he might return to the stand-up stage for the first time since the 80s, and I'm hoping that it's just as funny as some of my favorites, which are raw and delirious. Yes. <laughs> so that's all for right now. I want to thank my guests, Sarita, Lionel, and Dean Nasty for joining us and sharing their uncensored commentary. And as always, thank you for watching. I'm Marley. See you next time.